I know there's a lot of secrets behind the scenes. You can't share any titles. Can we uh, get any other insight to the this next year that's coming out from CIP? Maybe number of titles or genres or anything specific? It's going to be at And then we're sort of diversifying a little bit around some of the stuff that we're nice. doing. Hello there, everyone, and I'm here with Canadian International Pictures. We have David and Jonathan, and uh, first of all, just thank you for coming on. I know we've been trying to make this work for months, and I, I've been stoked and wanting to do this for the longest time, so thank you. No, oh, thank you for having us. We're, we're, we're so stoked much. to be here. Yeah, sorry about the logistics between three different time zones and sort of relentless schedules. I'm glad we finally made it happen. Yeah, time zones. Time zones are not very kind when you're doing stuff like this. I've had to wake up at. I, th I think I woke up at four to interview somebody in Australia. I had to stay up really late to get uh, Adam in Japan. Yeah, there's there's a handful that have been <laughs> kind of grueling, but that's no big deal. Uh, a lot of the work we do is we're coordinating between Toronto, Los Angeles, and New Zealand. So, yeah, time zones are kind New of New Zealand. Yeah, wow, our designers in New Zealand. That, uh, that that doesn't help very much at all. I'm sure <laughs> it can be pretty rough. Late nights. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, first things first, I kind of wanted to start off this these first few minutes as like a little retrospective. You guys just completed your first year as a partner label. We got uh, a grand total, I think, 10 releases in that first year, first calendar year. And then you've already put one out in January that just showed up on my doorstep. I'm not kidding here. About an hour ago. I haven't even opened the package yet. So I uh, oh, have yeah. not been able to see that one yet. But now uh, we're going to be going into February where you're going to have your 12th release. How, how does it feel after this first year has been completed? It's been, it's been a real whirlwind kind of first year. Like we just have not stopped working on discs. We, we usually have right. several discs that we're kind of juggling at the same time. Like in the last 24 hours, we've been, you know, going back and forth with like edits and, um, you know, different conversations about like three or four different discs. So it's been kind of, they pile up. You don't totally notice that it's happening, oh, yeah. but yeah, a lot of, a lot of, a lot, a lot is happening. Interesting. How, uh, how, how do you feel like the reception's been? Because obviously when you guys come on with a name like Canadian International, there's some implications there. It's going to be focusing mostly on Canadian films. At, at, when you first came on to now, does it feel like there's been any change in that reception at all? Yeah, I mean, I think the audience has grown, but, but coming out of the gate, I mean, we took sort of nothing for granted and had very reasonable expectations. Right. Um, and so, like, even from release one, the Ernie game, I mean, I'm speaking for myself here, but it was, like, truly overwhelmed with, like, the audience reception, which is really cool because you sort of don't know. I mean, Canadian cinema, yeah. even within that, like, Quebecois cinema is very mysterious to oftentimes even Canadians, but certainly um, to folks in the States. So. You know, we went in very sort of like unsure of what the landscape would be, how certain titles would do, what kind of risks we could take. And uh, yeah, I don't know, it's been like 10 out of 10. It's been really exciting to see like, we can do a lot of different kinds of things. There's an audience sort of for all of it. Um, right. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been super heartening. And the different things, you guys truly have covered like the gamut of genres. There's so many different things that you've put out from an Amityville movie to these uh, French New Wave films to... Uh, something like the Rainbow Boys. We have Donald Pleasance front and center in this film. What is uh, the overall, other than Canadian, is there something that feels like these are very much a Canadian International's release for you guys when you're looking at them? I think every disc that we decide to release or every film we decide to release has in some way, um, it's different from what we're used to seeing. It's not like a, a mm -hmm. typical Canadian film, even though people who don't know about Canadian films, maybe they think, what we're releasing is just kind of standard issue Canadian cinema, but almost every one of these films has something that makes it really distinctive and makes it kind of stand out from um, what we're used to seeing the kind of spotlight shot shone on for, for Canadian cinema. Yeah. We sort of like calling the company Canadian international pictures, sort of like a big statement where like, you know, invoking right. the country. And so we kind of wanted to take that seriously and be like, all right, like it's not just connect exploitation. It's not just the documentary tradition out of like the NFB, like it should, right. it should represent, sort of as much as we can sort of get in there 
with the caveat, of course, that we want to love the movies. I mean, that's sort of where it lives and dies. And then on top of that, we sort of have very loose kind of like decade bookends, like 60s till like the mid 90s is sort of a rough space. But we make exceptions to that as well. That's good to know. Uh, with with that, that kind of leads into like one of the most obvious questions for me. Do you guys have any touchstone on why these are so underseen or underappreciated? That there's so many of these films that are uh, not to oversell them to a lot of people, but genuinely important films. They feel like they're they're things that are not your typical you know boutique physical label is going to focus on sort of exploitation films only these are very different very dramatic very real emotional films and it seems like a lot of these would have been very successful so i'm I'm just curious if there's an actual reason why so many of these are completely underseen i mean i think part of it is just the sense that there's a bit of a a journey involved in just getting getting the rights for these films and getting them to a state where they can be released um on disc and um I think we both wondered why a lot of these films hadn't been released earlier and it hasn't been that easy getting everything together, but it was certainly doable. And we've been able to, uh, keep, keep finishing a disc every month. So, um, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that other labels haven't, haven't released any of these films before. Gosh, we don't, um, don't want the competition. <laughs> other labels keep not releasing them. No, it's an interesting thing because we're, we're, um, you know, I run Arbolos Films as well with right. Vishnari, who's the third uh, in CIP, who's not here with us today. And you know, obviously, that's not focused on any national one national cinema, and it's sort of it's it's a different machine. But um, you know, we're kind of fighting it out on each one of those titles. Whereas with the Canadian films, it's sometimes really shocking to be like, "This is of a certain quality," and like nobody's nobody else is here. Right. Um, you almost you almost do a double take. It's like this is a legit masterpiece. Like, why was this not out in some sort of deluxe edition? You know, years and years and years ago. Right. Which is exciting if, it, you know, it adds to our sort of mission statement. It's like we're really serving like a really valuable purpose. But having seen sort of the other side of it as well, it's also um, a relief to not have to fight it out on every title. So it's like, oh, we're here and people are excited to work with us and this is happening. Yeah. Like it's, you can mobilize it really quickly in a way that's exciting. And all that said, like there are many Canadian films that have been released on Blu-ray. Of we're course. just kind of stepping in and, and tackling the other ones. You know, like if it hasn't been touched yet, then it qualifies and we have kind of a, it's not that narrow a mandate for our label, but it's narrow enough that it gives us a real kind of focus. A, a lot of those, though, they've they've gotten many releases throughout the years, and they're they're just sort of those same milked Canadian properties for for decades. And th- there's a lot here that it, it's it's genuinely important. Like I said, you know, you got Donald Pleasance, you've got these. Uh, the, the Amityville title, obviously, that's an easy one to pick on because it's so well known. But even something like "Don't Let the Angels Fall" or the big one, the Buster Keaton release, these these seem like they should have been in the hands of people for years. And I'm kind of shocked. Like the Buster Keaton, I'm surprised Keno Lorber didn't run after that on day one or something. Yeah, well, we sort of made the the, the back of the company year one anyway. It was like a, a big deal that we did with the National Film Board of Canada, and that's where a lot yeah. of those titles came from. And we're obviously, we've diversified even in the back half of the first year and into the second year, it'll be sort of a, a different thing. But I think it was really sort of tapping that resource. Um, and a lot of those films you just mentioned sort of come out of the film board and they're super right. essential to the country. And for a long time, the National Film Board had their own sort of like in-house DVD label. And then that sort of got, you know didn't disappear, but it, it sort of shrunk a little bit. And then there was sort of this Blu-ray gap that we could sort of fill. And yeah. so I think that's, that, that helped a lot. They've been amazing partners and there's just, I mean, the NFB is obviously super central to the entire history of Canadian cinema and especially the, the years that we're sort of zeroing in on, you end up with a treasure trove of films. And so that was, you know, I think in part an answer to that, to your question. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, for anybody watching, there is a link to an interview that you guys did with Chasing Labels in the description below. I don't want to copy a lot of what they said before. So one of the things that you talked about on there is film programming. Uh, you, you've both had at least some hand in that. And I've talked a lot about film programming on here because it's something that I've uh, sort of tried to help with and and present as genuinely like an art form to a lot of people and as an adjacent uh, adjacent type of conversation this feels to me a little different instead of uh you know sort of programming for a wide audience that have never seen these before this almost feels like hey i love this film 
Let's sit down on the couch. I'm excited about this movie. And while you're sitting there, I'm going to look over you for reactions the entire time to make sure you love it with me. Does it feel like you're, you're sharing the, this underseen gem with the world and, and you're seeing an amazing reaction to it the way that it, it's perceived on the outside? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big part of it. And I think the other element of it is just getting to sit down with the film and create additional content, like yep. interview people involved with the film, interview interview admirers or experts on the films. And, you know, part of that you talk about the the kind of eclectic slate, part of how we landed there is just, it's really nice to go from working on something like um, uh, the Amityville Curse to like a month or two later, we're working on Kana Sataki, like totally right. different planets, pretty much like wildly different films. Um, but it, it keeps it kind of um, unexpected and exciting for us. It's good to hear. I, I'm, I'm curious, the the way that these reviews have uh, sort of been amassing for a lot of these that have not been seen many times, does it feel like uh, you've gotten any feedback from the people involved in any of these films where they're seeing that sort of rising appreciation for their films at all? I mean, yeah, the, the short answer is yeah. Sorry, I'm thinking of like who the best example <laughs> yeah. of that would be with the film. Well, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the filmmakers have passed of um, course. and are no longer with us. Um, but something like Forbidden Love, which is already yeah. very, very loved in the 90s and already very iconic, but maybe still a little mysterious to like, especially American audiences. Definitely. You know, seeing how well that sold like out of the gate and, you know, all the reactions on social media and stuff were really exciting. And to be able to sort of relay that to the filmmakers and then have screenings sort of around that that they could attend if they were local. Nice. Like that was that was incredibly cool and gratifying, and they're also just like amazing women on top of it, so they're just fun to hang out with and talk to. But um, that's that's the example that sort of leaps immediately to mind. Yeah, and the, the first restoration that we did in house, which um, hasn't come out on disc yet, but is the hard part begins, which is the first film by Paul Lynch, who made uh, Prom Night and lots of other interesting eighty genre films, humongous cross country. Um, he came to town for the the premiere of that uh, that restoration, and just getting to hang out with him before and after the screening i sat beside him he's kind of elbowing me during the screening like whispering <laughs> trivia to me and um but just being really enthusiastic about seeing this film that's been kind of buried for decades uh mm -hmm. have a new life like for him um that's that's reward enough he's not he's not in it to make money or anything he's just he just wants to see his film uh have another life the, the restoration brings up a an interesting point to kind of swerve the conversation here because it seems like there's been a lot of uh I'll just say the word complaining, uh, not about you guys, but just in the general physical media world of people that don't really understand how the the acquisition and then transferring to a physical release works. And a lot of people are assuming that every single boutique label is doing a restoration on every film they put out. Obviously, that's not true. And we know that. But could you take a moment to explain how many of these are released and how how the restoration has little to do with the label a lot of the time? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can sort of approach it. Um, you know, in the case of, for instance, the film board, I was talking about a lot of our first year, they have a division in-house that does those restorations. Right. And so when we're, um, you know, making a deal with them as part of that negotiation, we're getting the new master that they've made or the master that's been around. Um, and then, you know, on the other hand, you can have something like the hard part begins where we're working with Paul, we're going to acquire the film through him. And then we're going to talk to Library and Archives Canada. We're going to source, you know, the original negative. They'll scan it there, and then we'll, you know, through our partners in house, you know, clean it up, do the color grade, work with Paul to get the approval, and, and sort of have that whole process. But you know, it can come from a lot of different places. Sometimes it's like rights holders will restore the film themselves and then sell that master to other people. Sometimes it's archives do a restoration in house and then it becomes available. Like there's a lot of different sort of ways you can do it. But yeah, more often than not. You know, um, I think for a lot of labels, they're acquiring an existing master uh, as, as opposed to doing it sort of from scratch in-house. And I mean, of course, there's exceptions to that. But yeah. yeah, the biggest example I've seen lately is Paramount. A lot of people complaining about the masters and saying something like, you know, Lorber, you, you could have done so much more with this restoration, not understanding. Sure. You know, never even touched it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. When you're when you're doing your own restoration in house, you of course have a lot more um, like oversight and control over the decisions right. that get made when it comes to that. Whereas when you're you know when you're licensing an existing master, it's finished and you're receiving it. Um, this actually brings up we should give them a shout out because a lot of the work that we're doing revolves around restorations they've done specifically of Quebecois cinema. There's uh, a company called Elephant in uh, based in Montreal, and they're doing you know like the Lord's work with with Quebec cinema. And they're doing really, really beautiful sort of in-house restorations. And so when we're 
collaborating with them. We have a couple things coming out next year that we can't talk about yet, but stay tuned. Uh, and those are coming from like new 4K restorations that they've completed. And then separately, we do a deal with the rights holder to acquire it and put it out. Nice. Yeah, and the restoration, the the existing master, existing restoration uh, element is a big part of kind of the timeline on the releases. So there are a whole oh, bunch yeah. of films we've acquired where we're planning them for like a year or two down the road because we need to, we're doing the restoration work ourselves. But if um, the film has already been restored recently by a company like Elephant, then those are pretty much ready to go. So we know those can fill slots in the, you know, in the, in the not too distant future. So that's a kind of a key aspect of it too. How long did this first restoration that you're putting out, how long did that take you guys? We'll say like, we just want to say like maybe four months, John, four or five months. Yeah, it was a lot of work at the beginning, a lot of work at the end and, uh, you know, other projects kind of pulled everyone away from right. it in the middle. Yeah, yeah I think that's it, also it, a thing about, sorry to cut you off, about no, like doing these sort of in-house things is there, there is a lot of stop and start, especially if you've, you're juggling, oh, like yeah. John is sort of mentioning, like multiple releases and multiple timelines. And, you know, we're a small company, so there's only three of us. So there's also just like, there's only so many hours in the day, you know, so you can't necessarily like give notes on a color grade if you're also like right. finishing an edit and doing a license agreement and things like that. So. Well, and time zone differences, even for a lot of people, uh, it, from what I've seen on the outside looking in, a lot of these, there's, uh, you know, the whole game of telephone in between every step of the process, which lengthens everything. And uh, on top of all that, then you get feedback on something that you have to go fix something that you got late. And then on top of that, special features and interviews. Uh, yeah, it, it can really draw some of these out, I'm sure. It's yeah. a true because I'm, I'm based in Los Angeles uh, and like waking up every morning three hours behind the East Coast has become a true, a true night. It's very anxiety inducing to be just like half the day is gone. But like we should, talking about our, our designer in New Zealand, uh, Dylan Haley, who's a really talented designer who's worked on, um, in one way or another, all of our releases. And oh, wow. uh, he's worked with Arbalos, I think, on all your discs, David? Yep. Yeah. And um, because he's in New Zealand, quite often what's happening, sometimes I'm actually watching your show on like a Thursday night because we have something to do and I'm it's like midnight or something and I'm talking to him in New Zealand where it's I don't know three in the afternoon or something right and that's so that's a common kind of collaboration that happens between us or you know we're trying to make a meeting work between one person's dinner and another person like putting their kids to bed or something like there's there's a, a really um interesting kind of balancing act that that's involved that's tough. I, uh, my day job, I, I supervise people in uh, Pacific Mountain and Central Standard Time, and even just that is awful. I, I can't imagine the whole <laughs> New Zealand and, and Toronto at the same time. That, that's a lot to manage, I'm sure. Before we move off the restoration thing, I just wanted to give a shout out. It's uh, you know Sebastian at ACPA who's really doing a lot of the color work and a lot of the digital cleanup. So we're working kind of closely with him as, as, as like a vendor doing that, and he's just done really excellent work. So I just wanted to make sure we didn't fail to mention him because he's he's the best well another outside looking in it seems like there's uh i don't know if it's probably somewhere between about five and ten of these restoration houses that are doing so many of the works these days and a lot of people don't possibly don't understand that some of the reason for the backup is because it's the same place restoring for you know a lot of times the, the entire world there's a lot of these restorations that are being done say you know italian cinema there, there's one or two places where a lot of the masters because they don't want them to leave the country they're done in a couple little houses and then sending digital files primarily across uh to hopefully put out the best possible product but is there um anybody that uh other than you know your heavy hitters that you've been working with that you have worked with as well that are you know commonly used by other companies just so we can see uh some sort of you know comparison basis well since the hard part begins is sort of the first one that we've done in-house as cip we're sort of at the beginning of that process nice uh as arbalos we've been doing it over the course of many years and working with a lot of vendors you know internationally and also like domestically in new york and la and we were doing a lot of that work in-house and then uh, we had a colorist who was in LA that we loved, and then he went down to Atlanta. So, yeah, for that company, we've we've sort of been a little bit more all over the map. But for for CIP, it's uh, so far it's it's been a lot of the scanning gets done at Library and Archives Canada, like our national archive in Canada, who do have an awesome 4K scanner and do really great work, and they're awesome over there. And then, yeah, everything sort of goes down to to Sebastian. We sort of work really closely throughout the nice. the color grade and the the digital cleanup. And then, of course, Paul Lynch. It's always amazing to have a filmmaker who's you know, that thankfully still with us, but also like really sharp and engaged and like wants to, you know, give an approval and knows what he's looking at and all that. So yeah. it was a, it was a sort of a 
Felicitous first project as a CIP restoration because everything sort of went right. They're also That's unique. Good. They're unique cases with restoration, like um, with the Rainbow Boys. That was just a company, uh, a cool company out in Winnipeg called Zelko Entertainment, and they had actually done that restoration themselves, and they were doing some theatrical dates. And we were kind of like, "Do you think they have Blu-ray plans?" We just reached out and hit it off, and and uh, decided to kind of partner on that release. So that was a a unique case. We also just worked with Adam McGoin on a on a film that was sort of restored through through his company. I'm not even sure who his restoration partners were on that. But um, so that that didn't fall into any of the other buckets. But yeah, it's it it is kind of case by case. Interesting. That's uh, it's crazy when some of these small, you know, little restoration companies that basically out in the middle of nowhere can have an entire film in their hands that they they can just unleash upon the world. That's that's great that you guys were able to partner up on that. Then, uh, looking back, first year retrospective again. Um, are are there any of these specifically that you guys were like? Oh my God, we get to release this. Is there anything that was shocking to you? Just, I'm so glad that we get to share this with everybody. Yeah, that's a good, I mean, it sounds I'm, like disingenuous, but like all of them, you know, just the fact that we're doing this at all yeah. is exciting. <laughs> right. um, for me, it's, you know, I mean, obviously like Forbidden Love was a huge thing and coming on the heels of the, the Buster Keaton set, those both found like an even larger audience than, than the first yeah. couple titles. So that was really exciting to have it hit this sort of critical mass. I'm always because I'm I'm from Montreal, so I always have like a special place in my heart for the for like uh, like French Canadian Quebecois cinema because yeah. there's just a gold. It's a gold. Like there's so much good stuff from the '60s and '70s, and and so much of it, even in English Canada, is like mysterious. But let alone the states. So when we put out um, the other French New Wave set, which was John's idea to, to curate him in that way, which I think was an inspired one, and then Jacques Godbout's, wonderful release, by the way. Yeah. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thanks. And then Jacques Garbou's uh, The Mob, that gimmick that we did after that, was, was really exciting to put out because number one, the movie rules, and number two, it was just this cool thing to see. You know, I keep relaying this anecdote, but it's lodged in my brain. <laughs> Having people in the stage just be like, oh, there's the mafia in, in Canada? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, it exists, especially in Quebec in the 70s. Um, so yeah, not only discovering this thing, but like, you know, uh, like the context around it and what that says about Canada and Quebec at the time is, is really exciting. So. It's a nice stereotype to have to fight that everybody in Canada is too nice, that there can't be a mafia. <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, as you'll see, like the more things we put out from, especially Quebec in the 70s, the, 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 the mob remains a, a very present theme. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's really exciting because it's like a national city, you know, that, uh, that is just so completely underseen and unknown to people that it's, right. it's rare in 2023 to be like, all right, here's like a whole subset of a national cinema that most people exactly. have no idea about, have no context for. And that sort of, you know, it bleeds into this other thing that's exciting about doing the sets that John sort of uh, mentioned before is, you know, there's the film, but then there's also everything that we're sort of building around it, you know, and the opportunity to not only release these things, but to have, you know, experts and the filmmakers and authors and academics sort of fully contextualize them for, yeah. for audiences is, uh, yeah, I don't know, th there's a real pleasure in doing that. Yeah, like, I, I would say that... Um... All the films, there are no films that we're just releasing for the hell of it. Even, you know, people have not a lot, a lot of nice things to say about Amityville Curse, but we even have affection for that, and it was so much fun working on that. Um, but, you know, so at some point we kind of started to take, uh, well, there were so many NFB films that we just kind of felt like uh, it felt natural to release any any additional uh, NFB films. So that was really exciting. But the first, the first film that wasn't part of the NFB deal was The Kid Brother. And that was just a, re that was a really exciting one to work on because... One, it has such a unique story. Yeah, we, we licensed it directly from the filmmaker, Claude Gagnon. We got to talk to him. We got to hang out with him, uh, well, on Zoom, really, for a, a whole bunch of meetings beforehand, and then did a long interview with him. And um, th that just that whole project was really enlightening and a lot of fun to work on. And um, I actually wanted to show you a funny thing. So one of the first places I ever heard about that film was in a book that uh, Kayla Janice, who we worked with on that disc, she did a commentary, and Paul Korup, who's done commentaries for some of our discs, edited there's this book called uh kid power if you can find a copy of this it's definitely worth seeking out there's actually uh there's a little glimpse of kenny there on the inside <laughs> cover and the um the uh the rick tremble's comic strip that's in there came from that book it was actually created for that book wow but when kayla was promoting that book she got some skateboards made some kenny branded skateboards and she gave us some to well to eventually give away but I just want to show you this. Check this. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah, it's a pretty cool piece of merch. 
That's fantastic. Never posted yeah, that's penny screen one of the better films uh, out of this entire stack. I, I absolutely love that one. Obviously, uh, not for everybody because a lot of people are buying physical media just because they like, you know, the, the 80s trash cinema sort of thing. But it, it was just such a like a wholesome story. And, and just the ability to dive in and live in that world was just it, it was so welcome for a night. Yeah, it's it's for a film that has that does have kind of a cult following, certainly in Quebec. Um, it's just surprising that it hasn't had a broader release or yeah. any kind of physical media release. There might be a, a DVD somewhere, but um, certainly no Blu-ray before our disc. Mm -hmm. The uh, contextual extras that's been mentioned a couple times in the last few minutes. And this is something that I, I just really got to hit on because there's obviously a lot of labels doing this nowadays. But the fact that you are able to take an incredible feature film and put it with... Uh, in many cases of these discs, either a bonus film or interviews and commentaries and all these other special features, uh, a lot of times booklets. <coughs> Is there anything that uh, you're, you're really trying to focus on with those special features other than giving the genuine context of the, of the Canadian history behind it? Because there's there's not a lot doing it like you all. It, these are, are are stuffed to the gills in a way that is hard to compare to much of anything else because uh, to compare to like a record, the, the A side and the B side here, it, a lot of times they're either equally as important or just as good quality or just astonishing that we're finally getting some of these. And it's amazing that we're just, yeah, let's, let's slip this one in here as an extra sometimes. Yeah, that's kind of you to say. Thanks, man. It's interesting, like when we started, there wasn't like we didn't sit down and have like a big conference about like all of these sets need to be like totally stacked. Otherwise, right. like we're not interested in doing it. It happened, I think, just really organically because the three of us are excited about the work and excited about what goes on like around it. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of how we decide that, I think it's always, you know, you start with the principles like who's around the director, the cinematographer, the you know the writer, the, the, the stars. Um, and then we try to get as many of those folks as we can. And then, you know, then you go to sort of the next level of like, all right, well, if this is something that is existing in a very specific place in time, how can we get somebody to sort of speak to that and to sort of situate it? Right. Because otherwise people are maybe going to have a little bit of trouble sort of finding their bearings. Um, you know, and then, I mean, John can talk a little bit about the, the NF, about the shorts, like the short features, because the, the NFB is so uh, rightly famous for doing many things, but short, short films were hugely important and remain hugely important you know to the board so it felt a little bit like how can we really be doing our job if we're putting out this work without right. without shorts sort of in the mix as well yeah i mean the good news with a lot of these releases is not only are there a bunch of canadian features that haven't been properly distrib distributed or not properly but widely distributed certainly on physical media but there's so many companion films that are just sitting there waiting to be released alongside them so, I mean, even on something like, like Nobody Wave Goodbye, we have some amazing Dono and shorts, um, as we did on the, on the Ernie Game disc, but there's also a whole other feature film that's only kind of loosely connected. It's not really, uh, it's not a Dono and film. It's not a, um, uh, it's not narratively connected. It's just a film that's kind of exploring youth culture in the same place a few years later, which is uh, right. Christopher's movie matinee. But there, there are other things, like we've had a lot of fun, like on um, the other French New Wave, for example, where... Yeah, we have bonus films that are made by the filmmakers who made the features, but we also have films that are really totally disconnected, except that they also came from the NFB at the same time, and we paired them with the features to kind of recreate the experience of going to see an NFB film in the 60s yeah. and seeing a short short subject beforehand. Well, it's the hard thing with a lot of these shorts. Go ahead. Oh, no, it's just like, it, you know, it's, it's famously tough just to get shorts distributed and seen. That just remains. It's exactly what I was about to say. We, we so rarely ever get any of these shorts. So what you guys are doing, it seems so vastly important for many of these because they'll literally never be seen again in some of these cases unless we get it out there like that. Well, it's, there's, there are cases like um, we included the film Very Nice, Very Nice, the Arthur Lipset film um, on before Cat in the Bag on the other French New Wave. And that's probably the most significant and influential film on that set. I mean, that was a huge influence on Stanley Kubrick and George Lucas yeah. and um, Arthur Lipset is a really major Canadian filmmaker. Um, and we just kind of snuck that on the disc as a, as an almost hidden extra. I mean, I think it's mentioned on the back of the back cover, but you know, it's not the central central feature of the disc. Right. And that's, that's amazing that we can do something like that in 2023, because obviously when you're looking at physical media in a, in a year like this, you're not thinking, Hey, let's just, let's throw in influential short films as, as a bonus just for funsies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, a lot of these are unique in so, so many different ways. But one of the things that I absolutely had to bring up is uh, Helicopter Canada. Now, the fact that we have that in there and we've got this uh, smile box view, uh, so glad that we're able to get stuff like that, that preserves the original uh, the original aspect, the, the way that people should have been viewing it back in the day with that creative control that they had. Um, any any interesting stories on, on that getting to disc like that? Because it's it's obviously not something that we see a ton of. I think Warner Archive just did one in the last year or so, but not not many coming out in, in Smile Vision. That was to to be honest, that actually isn't the correct way to watch the film. If you want to be a purist, oh, interesting. It, if you want to be a purist, go back and watch the two three five version. Although the two three five version, you can see splices. So we offered an alternate uh, um, two seven six version that hides the splices. The, uh, the smile box is really just a kind of, we had space on the disc, barely, but they're, they're shorter feature <laughs> films that are on there. Um, and it just kind of made sense, given the style of that film, it's, it's so uh, similar to the, the Cinerama yeah. films that have been presented in Smilebox on Blu-ray. Um, that it was, it was, we kind of re-reached out to the people who do Smilebox, who, like Tom March, who's one of the Cinerama nice. restorationists. And uh, he thought it was a cool idea, and he prepped that version, and it looked great, so we included it on the disc. But it was kind of an experiment and not not necessarily the correct way to watch the film, we should clarify. That really sticks out for me. And then something like uh, Nobody Wave Goodbye. There, there's so many extras on that one that are just seemed important. W was there any sort of fascinating stories with how that disc came together? Yeah, well, that one is, I mean, it made sense because that's, uh, like, we have huge love for Ernie game obviously we launched the label with it uh but right. arguably the, the most famous Don Owen film is no big wave goodbye so we sort of knew very early on that that would be in the slate as well um and then most of his early work is through the board so that sort of made sense to sort of you know uh. package it that way and then you know it had originally toured with a short film sort of in front of it when it went theatrically nice. so we were like all right well that's also through the board so this will kind of make sense we can sort of recreate like john was saying what the program would have been if you saw it theatrically uh, and then Steve Gravesock, Tiff programmer, was, uh, who wrote a great book on Don Owen, was really kind, took some time out of the schedule and chatted with us for the booklet and gave, you know, that sort of the, the big contextual piece. Oh, look at that. You've <laughs> <laughs> this, um, this is an homage to Ryan because I know he likes to hold up discs. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the same thing. <laughs> uh, Got to hold it up for everybody. Yeah, the, and, and for, for context... I have every single one stacked next to me. These are, this is one of those labels that it's, it's something that you can trust from day one and not just saying that because you're on, on the interview like this. It is something that every single disc, there's something important that uh, obviously should be restored and archived. But more than that, it's something that just to make your, yourself appreciate film more, there's so much to find in all of these. And when they're so varied, you you have a palate cleanser every month. It's not something that you can get stuck in. It's not something that uh, here comes another 80s slasher and I know exactly what to expect. These are all so vastly different that all it, it it's film school from a label that you can dive in and discover that, but also for an entire country. It, and it seems so important to get caught up in that culture and just learn about it because we're simply not educated on it usually. Yeah, well, it's it's a uh, it is a joy to be able to get to get to do that. Like it's a big mandate, so it's a, sometimes shocking that this is <laughs> what we get to do with the label. But uh, yeah, I mean that's I don't know that we approach it necessarily from like an academic mindset, but definitely from like a, it, it can serve that function, and that's exciting. And we don't see ourselves as these all-knowing Canadian cinema experts. You know, we <laughs> we're also learning along the way, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Discovering films all the time. But the other thing I, I, I'd say about Nobody Wave Goodbye and the Ernie game is those two discs, if anybody has one of them but not the other, if you put them together, that's the complete Don Owen in the 60s. And he's really one of the most important early Canadian filmmakers. And yeah. so just to get to watch all of his works from that kind of like peak period in his career, uh, I think that's one of the one of the, the strong points of the, those two discs. Like, yeah, Don Owen is on the short list of... of, of kind of Canadian film industry, capital I industry architects and nobody would goodbye is hugely important. It's sort of right up there with like going down the road. Um, just probably better known in the States now, but hopefully post this release, uh, nobody would goodbye is climbing up there as well. But yeah, hard to overstate how important Donovan was in terms of just uh, uh, building a foundation for what would become a, the Canadian film industry. Well, and funny enough, I just wanted to worship at his feet a little bit more because that disc, like 
we have the main feature there's a bonus feature and then I, I, there's either three or four short films on there as well and it's they're they're not like four minute short films they're like 20 minute short films or more and it's it's a lot of content and for a lot of people that are either budget minded or just trying to watch the way they blind buy this is one of those things that it's more than worth it because it's it's basically the price of like uh, one film and you're getting perhaps three or four worth of of all of that content plus some bonus features that's that's kind of incredible yeah i mean again we didn't set out to be like we'll make them the most stacked things ever but it became very apparent very quickly that that was going to be how we were going to operate and like we, we just pushed a release uh like earlier this week because we just didn't have enough to make it sort of uh wow. it, it didn't like meet the standard of what we want to do with cip in terms of like the extras and the essay and things like that so it'll come out but you know we pushed it a couple of months so that we can make sure that the set is something that we you know can stand behind in that way and actually nobody waved goodbye was a funny case where we were we were in the process of finishing the disc for minefield which was originally going to come out in september and um the, we just ran into a delay on some aspect of that and um we were like, well, we've already kind of prepared everything for uh, Nobody Wave Goodbye. So we managed to, to pull that together really quickly and get that disc to fill the slot where Minefield was. We thought wow. we were going to have to miss a month, but we managed to fit it in there. So it's nice to have that much material kind of waiting in the wings in case we run into problems. Right. And, and that's, I mean, for your first year to have 10 full releases in one year, I, I don't think a lot of people understand that, that that is a lot to do in one year, especially when uh, you don't have the... Uh, the pedigree of being your own label before you were a partner label. This is just, hello world, we're, we're here, and now here's 10, 10 films in 11 months, and or 10 films in 12 months. And that's... Actually, 11, 11 films in 12 months, because we, we missed uh, February. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. I, that's where I was getting my math wrong. Uh, so, Ernie Game came first, then we had the fr other French New Wave, the mob hit after that, then Buster Keaton, and that was... Uh, or no, Forbidden Love was in June, so that was the first half of the year. The second half of the year, it seemed to be, uh, we were sort of witnessing a little bit of like fandom change. Like you mentioned earlier, it's grown. How How has the reception gone? Because the second half of the year, it feels like everybody was talking about Canadian International Pictures every single month. And that's, just for me, that's exciting to see a young label get that sort of attention. Because that sort of explosion is not a given at all. Oh, that's cool. I don't think I'd even fully registered that. <laughs> that's so, right on. That's that's really cool to hear. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe John, you have like a more in depth uh, like analysis of this. Like, it just felt my big thing with it is just out of the gate, the amount of people that that care in, a, in, in like a genuine way was really overwhelming. Not that I was like, this is going to have no audience, but like, you never know. And right? There's certain stereotypes about like uh, false. I should add stereotypes about like, you know, Canadian cinema has no, like not a ton of reach and maybe there's not a lot of interest in the States. So, you know, the idea that there were that many people like from day one that were really into it. And then that growth, we have seen it, but it's been sort of, um, like organic from release to release. Like there hasn't really been like a big moment where it's like all of a sudden it's all different. Like it just feels like with each, and some of them obviously like forbidden love and Buster Keaton, you saw like there was obviously more of a reception, right. but yeah, overall, it's just been like amazing that people care as much as they do. And with each release, we kind of grow the audience a little bit. At least that's what it sort of feels like. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we could have predicted which discs were going to be big. Like, I think we thought Amityville Curse was going to be yeah. big, and it was, again, even though people, uh, you know, give one-star <laughs> reviews on Letterboxd. Right. Um, but <laughs> but uh, it's a great hangout movie. I don't know. Well, yeah. And most of them knew they were going to rate it one star before they bought it. Yeah, oh, they didn't even watch yeah. it. I don't know. It's it's a weird thing, but um, like Buster Keaton rides again. You know, we love Buster Keaton, and we know a lot of other people do. But I don't think we expected it to be as as popular as it was. Um, so that was you know very exciting, and, and gave us a lot more confidence to take some chances on other things. Some some discs that have even haven't even come out yet, but that we're kind of planning mm. for the future. Yeah, that was an interesting one where it's sort of like because the two the, the two medium length films, Helicopter Canada and Buster Keaton, right. rise again. That it's sort of like, all right, like it's Buster Keaton. He's obviously like a super iconic movie star. To tell people that, but you know, going through um, to like the Vinegar Syndrome OCN audience, we're sort of like, I don't know, are people going to care necessarily about right. Buster Keaton in that way? Like our audience at that point was maybe not like what Kino's audience is, right? So we're sort of like, all right, that's like a bit of a a bit of a gamble, and also just this idea that it's sort of you know, like the overarching thing is it's a travelogue across Canada between the two films, but 
it's sort of a double bill of two medium lengths. So that's, you know, almost puts you into not short film territory, but it stops being necessarily a slam dunk when you're not like, here is the traditional 90 right. minutes or longer feature film adorned with these other things. So it was like a little bit of a, a double bill. So the fact that that sold as well as it did was just like, as John's saying, it's like, great, we can, we can do more sort of like uh, unconventional pairings and things like that. Yeah, the other really strange thing about that disc is we had already acquired Rainbow Boys, which is directed by Gerald Potterton, who is the the director of the film within the film of Buster Keaton Rides Again. So he's the guy who's hanging out with uh, Buster and directing him throughout the film. And we knew Buster Keaton, or, or sorry, the Rail Rider, what am I talking about? Rainbow Boys. We knew that was coming out <laughs> later in the year. Um, and we, were kind, we kind of thought, well, we can maybe prepare people for that disc with Buster Keaton Rides Again, because there's about six or seven shorts by Gerald Potter on that disc, and we interviewed him for the disc. And we figured we'd get to work with him extensively on the Rainbow Boys, but he actually passed away while we were working on that disc. Mm -hmm. So there's there's still a commentary, and there's, there are a bunch, there's a long interview with him on that disc, but it's just, uh, you know, in a way, we're glad we worked on Buster Keaton Rides Again when we did, because we got to, you know, get to know him a little bit. Yeah, definitely. He was amazing. Well, you can tell when you watch Buster Keaton Rides Again, he's the charming British guy. Who's, yeah. You know, every bit as lovable, well, almost as lovable as Buster Keaton. Hard to be lovable as Buster Keaton. That's a good point. And that's, uh, I've said it before on here, but the fact that we have so many labels nowadays, uh, not only archiving and, and restoring these films, but also archiving a lot of the voices behind them. This is kind of the last opportunity for a lot of people. It just it, every single month, it seems like we are exponentially rising in the number of famous voices that are gone from us. And uh, not to mention, there's a lot of them that are still alive, but maybe not able to recall everything or yeah. even have the ability to speak on something for 90 minutes. And it's it's so important to capture that just to see how they've grown as a person, how the film impacted them, and some of those contexts, it's, uh, again, it's impossible for a lot of us to judge because we're we're not those filmmakers. So I'm just glad that you guys got that opportunity. Yeah, it's always like, not a mad scramble, but you know, you, you're you always very conscious of people getting on in years if they're still with us, the, the filmmakers, and I mean, all the principals involved. So it's always a, like the sooner the better for all of that. Right. But yeah, and then yeah. sometimes people are around and they're like, you know, so rigorous thinkers and they, and they just don't, really want to talk about that part of their life anymore or they're just not interested in being on camera like we reached out um to to jacques Godbou for the mob and he was he sent a really nice note back it was like i'm really stoked that this is happening but uh i'm good like, i don't <laughs> i don't really do these things anymore but like god bless and it's like great all right cool eventually he did um uh, we, we sort of twisted his arm and he did a text interview that's um that's, <laughs> yes, that's, that's by email yeah. i guess that was for, yeah that was for the video interview i should say yeah Nice. Uh, so that was the first year, and then January comes, and you guys release this, uh, from everything I've read about it behind the scenes, very, very important release. Can you can you give some context on what came out in January from you? Yeah, so Kanesataki, 207 Years of Resistance, is obviously easily one of the greatest Canadian documentaries of all time. I'd argue one of the greatest documentaries of all time, period. Um, that sort of focuses on the, uh, the Oka crisis, which was... Um, a big thing in Canada in the early 90s where there was uh, uh, an indigenous uh, reservation that was going to be infringed upon by the local, like the larger local community that wanted to build, I believe it's a nine hole golf course. Is that right, John? Or is it like a, I forget the amount of holes. Anyway, something really disrespectful and egregious yeah. that that sort of <laughs> incited like a, like a standoff that lasted for a long time. It's this really kind of like political and polarizing thing um, in, in Quebec and in Canada. And so, um, Alanis Obamsman, the filmmaker, was on the ground, like behind the lines, like, you know, wow. throughout that whole process and made this incredible film. And then um, three other films that sort of complete an Oka Crisis Quartet, all of which are on this set. Um, you know, the Kanesataki is sort of was the first one. And then the other three films are all equally masterful. And they sort of tease out different strands that were in Kanesataki and sort of elaborate on them. And yeah, it's, it's incredibly cool to be able to put that film out it's just it's so indisputably iconic it was a real treat alanise recorded a commentary like a new director's commentary for the set so being able to meet her last year was just incredible like she's you know 90 plus years old and just like as sharp as ever more energy than most 20 year olds you meet and just you know well you can hear it in the commentary like she's uh like a brilliant storyteller and you know fully um you know she, every, every bit the 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 filmmaker, activist, you know, musician, multi-hyphenate that, that you've heard she is. 
if you're aware for work. Like, it yeah. does not disappoint. And I've, I've never heard of somebody watching Kenna Sataki and being disappointed with it on some level. Like, it 100% delivers, but for everybody. Right. Like, I, I've never seen any kind of resistance to the film. Uh, no pun intended. But the, uh, the, the thing is, um, not, if you watch that film, you're definitely going to want to learn more. You're definitely going to want to know more. Um, the three films do, do the three extra f additional films do like an amazing job, kind of fleshing out what the film what the film deals with um, the, the, some of the characters in the film. Also, the commentary is actually like a an emotional and kind of intense experience in its own right. At least it was for me. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. That is actually the most uh, anticipatory thing that I I can't wait for that release because there's. Uh, I think the original release was, what, 92 or 3, right? 93, yeah. So uh, for something like that, where, when they're talking about uh, all of the, the resistance that came behind that, looking at how uh, we, we've potentially not grown at all in the last 30 years is just one of the the most like egregiously difficult things to process as somebody trying to fight for the, the resistance behind some of these things and stand up for other people and looking forward to that commentary is so just heartbreaking. The fact that we can look back 30 years and see what hasn't changed. And uh, I actually felt that again last night watching your release that's being announced in February during one brief moment. Uh, how about we, we start breaking into February because this ties in uh, ever so slightly. What do you got coming for us? So just just continuing on the on the path we were on with uh, Kana Sataki. No, I will explain. I promise. Yeah, um, uh, we're so we're releasing um, uh, Hitman Heart Wrestling with Shadows, which is I mean I think some people who know that film might not even realize it's a Canadian film, although Canada is kind of an important part of the subject matter in the film, um, and it is a, a National Film Board of Canada production. Oh wow, I didn't know that part. That's actually really interesting. Um, I was able to watch it last night, and the one thing I wanted to point out is this emotional beat of uh, Bret Hart just completely going into the uh, the racist divide and how there's uh, so many different things that people are oppressed by with that and uh, the class divide and with uh, police and all, all these other things that came into this, this really heartfelt moment in that film, and I just was transported back to the 90s i haven't watched a lot of professional wrestling since around that time and i was never i was never deep into anything surrounding bret hart around that time were, were you guys uh, obviously this is gonna be the most obvious question were you guys ever entrenched in wrestling like that was was bret hart important to you i i, I briefly flirted with wrestling when i was like a really little kid <laughs> but um I, I never went that deep into it i'm i'm kind of more interested in, in it um, on the level of just performance and yeah. this strange kind of uh, uh, fiction that exists where, you know, and the film deals with this, how something real is coming through, but it's mixed with something that's definitely not real. Yeah. And uh, it, it, like what you're talking about, he has these monologues about Canada and comparing it to the United States, but he even admits in the documentary that he doesn't agree with what some of what he's saying. Right. There's this strange yeah. kind of confusing blurred line between what's real and what's not real that kind of it, it's part of everything in wrestling but yeah i haven't watched a a wrestling match probably in 30 years or something and i'm a little too i missed the bret hart window i'm 37 so i came into wrestling or maybe i guess if i was in elementary school and watching it but i wasn't like i remember being in high school and that was like the era of like uh, The Rock and I guess the tail end of Stone Cold Steve Austin. And obviously Stone Cold Steve Austin is a huge part of wrestling with shadows, but I think I caught maybe the back half of his career if I'm getting my wrestling chronology correct. I but, believe I mean, that's was, pretty accurate, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was just, I mean, the director, Paul Jay, is, is sort of also not, I don't want to speak for him, but doesn't seem necessarily profoundly interested in being a right. wrestling historian. Like, I think he as a filmmaker is interested in a lot of the things that, that John was just talking about as being appealing to him about the film and to me. Yeah, and he kind of made kind it there when we right. interviewed him. Um, I don't really want to answer questions about uh, about wrestling or <laughs> yeah. even the film. He, he just kind of wanted to talk about the state of the world. But, you know, it turns out because he's the one who made the film that you can kind of riff on what's happening in the world right now and it finds its way back to Wrestling oh, yeah. Shadows. And even though I'm not necessarily like a, like a 
uh, diehard wrestling fan since my early youth, it was incredibly cool to get to hang out with Bret Hart. Like he contributed to the set. We got to, you know, spend a, like the better part of a morning um, recording him over Zoom. And, you know, he does a commentary and did an interview and stuff like that. He's, he's a really genuinely sweet and cool guy. The people who know, uh, uh, know what the film's about or just know about wrestling in the 90s will know about the Montreal screw job. Um, and at the end of the commentary, um, he, we were kind of getting ready to wrap it up. And he said, can we go back to the screw job and uh, record a little <laughs> more commentary? So we actually have a screw job specific commentary as, a, as an extra in addition to the commentary. Which is really neat. Uh, you guys sent the picture over what was going to be on the disc. And uh, even though I saw this and then the the little B-side that is the Owen Hart story, I, I'm so stoked to get this in again because I, I can't believe Bret Hart was willing to do that in, in 2022. That's, that's amazing that he's just ready to jump in and, and talk about it still because it was obviously such a huge cultural standpoint for a lot of people that were, uh, you know, big in the 90s. And with him being so like tenured in this industry is something that hit multiple generations, which not a lot of entertainers can even say that they had that sort of an impact. Yeah. Like the, the film came at a really tumultuous time, as you can tell from the film in, yeah. uh, in Bret Hart's life. And he, from what he said to us, he, he was just very grateful to Paul J for making the film and for um, sort of telling his story in a way that prevented his, I don't know, legend from being destroyed by how he exited the WWF. Um, so he was willing to work with us because we were working with Paul and he was just kind of, I think, yeah. partly doing it as a favor to Paul. But I think he also remembers the film really fondly. No, definitely. And I mean, it's it's such an iconic thing in his life that I think he still, I don't know if enjoys is the right word, but I think he, he uh, um, you know, having having his perspective on it articulated, I think, remains important to him. And a, a big uh, draw to a lot of these documentaries is, uh, unfortunately, sometimes the the tragedies behind it. And with both Brett and Owen's story, there's there's just so much entrenched in both of these that you can't help but feel immense pain for the entire family. Uh, the the Owen Hart story is a little personal because I I just like you, David, I, I came in sort of after Brett Hart, but I was there when Owen Hart uh, died, and it played this this huge shadow over all kinds of people around that time and i was young and you know still learning about a lot of that stuff and then to see how wrestling evolved since then it was kind of gross and uh nowadays i live in kansas city and uh, owen hart passed here in kansas city so to see that that is still a historic touch point for the city is kind of a big deal because they talk about that tragedy with a couple of others and from like the 80s to the late 90s, there's a few just major things that happen in Kansas City, and Owen Hart is one that will have a big historical point for a long time, I'm sure. Um, let's yeah. see. Uh, with that release coming out, what else do we have coming in the future? One thing that we saw teased, did you guys have your first 4K coming? We do. That's really exciting. Um, we can't reveal the title yet, but it's... Uh, I can reveal we just got the... Uh, the film just got scanned, so we just sort of got our preliminary condition report and sort of like... No color fading, materials in good shape. So it's, wow. it's, it's looking like clear sailing. Nice. Uh, it, obviously, a lot of people are going to ask, why choose to go 4Ks with certain titles and not others? And is that something that uh, immediately you would be like, well, every title will be a 4K? Or what are you using to distinguish that? Well, uh, yeah, sorry. One, uh, one issue is, you know, obviously the film has to, be, has to have an HDR grade. Right. Um, to, and to make sense on uh, on 4K UHD, and a lot of the films that are being restored without us, you know, beforehand don't have that. So that's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing is you just want to make sure you you're starting with really ideal elements. And in the case of the film that we're releasing on 4K UHD, we had the original negative shot in 35, um, and it just it made sense in the sense that we we felt like it's a film that has the potential to find a sizable audience. You know, some of the films we're releasing, we don't really expect them to be huge hits. Right. Um, I, mean, I don't know if this will be a huge hit, but it, it, I, I think people <laughs> will be, if you take a chance on it, you'll be happy. You'll be happy you did. I think it's also important, like this film has a filmmaker who's still with us and is engaged in the process. So I personally would feel a little less excited about an HDR grade if we didn't have a filmmaker who was like, involved in that process. Like that, that was important to me in terms of embarking on our first one, our first project right. like this. Um, th this brings up an interesting thing that I've had, uh, again, we talked about people complaining earlier, 
not curious if, or not curious, uh, curious if this is a, a fairly across the board type of answer that you can give. But a lot of people, they look at like Kino Lorber or somebody else putting out a 4K scan on a Blu-ray disc and go, well, why didn't they just flip the switch and put it on UHD? Most of the time it's because it didn't have an HDR grade. So off the cuff, could you possibly share with everybody what the difference is there cost wise? Because a lot of times there's no incentive to, to go in and invest suddenly to put a brand new HDR grade on something. Yeah. I mean, this is not like exact, but I mean, in terms of like what you're looking at with disc authoring and then the, the HDR grade, you're, you're not doubling a normal release cost wise, but it's, it's, you know, not that far away from that. It's, it's, it definitely costs quite a bit more. The economics are very different if you're going to do, if you're going to go the 4k rep. So that's sort of what John was saying before, like you need to know that there's, you'd be relatively sure that it's going to be a more, um, right. You know, that, that we at least feel very strongly that the audience is going to be there for it. I also think there might be, I mean, I don't know exactly what Kino's strategy is, but I know many of the films they've released on 4K UHD have already had um, Blu-ray releases, in many cases, Criterion Blu-ray releases with the yeah. same masters or, or similar masters, it seems. Um, I think there, there, some people might have the feeling if you go straight to 4K UHD without releasing a Blu-ray that you're not you may be shutting out part of the audience. I, I, mean, I don't know if that's if that's how people feel, but I, I think having a having a Blu-ray first, then a 4K UHD does kind of make make more sense. I think. Although in the case of the 4K UHD we're releasing, there was no Blu-ray, so we're kind of rolling the dice on that. <laughs> I think there's just a lot of people that don't quite understand the process because they they legitimately think that it's oh it's a business decision. These labels are obviously taking advantage of us. They're going to put this 4K scan out now and put out a, a UHD in 18 months and then call it a day. And I, I don't think that they understand that this is genuinely an investment and uh, a lot of the time there is no financial incentive for them to go put down almost the exact same uh, you know, ballpark figure of what they're already putting into the film just to do a UHD. Yeah. And I think for us, I mean, this might change. So, you know, like don't, don't hold me to it, but um, <laughs> you know, in terms of uh, what we've already put out on Blu-ray looking at, you know, if in a year or two, that's going to come out in like a 4k, that'll almost certainly because be because like a new 4k master becomes available. Like they're going to be like recycling thing. Right. And that, that's that been a complaint with a few other companies. Uh, Synapse was the worst one with Suspiria because everybody just looked at him and said, no, they, they just put the same exact thing out. But no, like Don May will tell you, they put a lot of work going from Blu-ray to 4K. Sure, yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of secrets behind the scenes. You can't share any titles. Can we uh, get any other insight to the this next year that's coming out from CIP? Maybe number of titles or genres or anything specific? It's going to be at least 11, possibly 12, depending on how a couple things shake out. So it'll be, yeah. Stack In terms here. of like volume of releases, it'll match year one, if not nice. slightly exceed it. And then we're sort of diversifying a little bit. There's going to be more of a theatrical push around some of the stuff that we're nice. doing. Uh, we have streaming rights on the stuff that we're restoring, which is, you know, we kind of have, it's like eight or nine titles over the course of, you know, when those come out, who knows, wow. but... Um, so there might be a little bit more of a streaming presence, even though kind of always going to remain at the core of the business as a you know home entertainment label. Good. Um, yeah, that's all very mysterious. I mean, the big one that we can we can sort of like direct people to is the hard part begins. Like we're really proud of that first in house CIP 4K restoration, like we did it the right way. Yep, there you go. Nice. <laughs> also, it's an awesome, awesome soundtrack. Very nice. Uh, and yeah, it might be a little mysterious, but it's still exciting. And again, the big thing with any of these films, because they were so hard to see for so long, is accessibility. And if you can put them on streaming and physical, I mean, it's the best of both worlds. We can all have access to it and call it a day. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's, it, there's a big misconception that these different like avenues somehow uh, are at war with each other, when in reality, at least from our experience doing it, like nothing cannibalizes each other. It's all just getting so for films right. like this that have no little to no awareness. Like it's just getting getting word out that the film is great and you should see it in some way, shape, or form. Exactly, and that's all of these are so high quality. I will just shout out again, please, if you've not picked up either any of these or skipped a certain month because you were unsure. Like the amount of content alone should be making you run for these discs, but if not. They are all absolutely worth it. Uh, the, I've seen most of them, but the ones that I have not yet are top of my list. Got to see them soon. And I'm just absolutely stoked to see how people respond to February and the rest of this year. Because with that growing fan base, that's 
it's it's exciting times for you guys. Yeah, on that note, I just say that uh, Hitman Heart. There's a commentary with Bret Hart. We already mentioned. There's this whole second film made by the same filmmaker and another filmmaker, Sally Blake, um, called The Life and Death of uh, uh, Owen Hart, his brother. And um, there's a, there's a whole whole bunch of other extras. So it's a pretty stacked set. But I would actually say that the disc we have coming uh, next is even more stacked, and the one after that is like jaw-droppingly stacked so i can't tell you what they are but it's it's almost weird how much content is on uh, these discs i think we could do we do a D, i mean the one that'll be coming out in what is that april fourth release of the year right is that april you go anyway yes. yeah we can say that it's an adam mcgoyan film you said that publicly but we won't say which one but that said is is yeah as john said sort of preposterously like you know we went all the way to the, the top of what the disc can hold with that, which was really exciting. Yeah, when you have a chance to work with a filmmaker who's not only uh, passionate about the project and, and, and Blu-ray, but actually is willing to be involved and enthusiastically <laughs> right. involved, and yeah. also controls the rights for many of his own films, um, it just it was such a, such a unique and exciting opportunity working on that one. Yeah, take advantage of it when you can. Yeah, that makes sense. It's great. Oh, totally. Well, like growing up as like Canadian cinephiles, obviously Adam McGoyan's like legacy justly looms large. So being able right. to sort of work with him was a, was a rare treat. Well, that's exciting. I'm very happy for you guys. Wish you all the success. And uh, genuinely just want to thank you for coming on here because uh, I've not kept it a secret. One of my favorite labels over the last year. You guys have put out pretty much solid gold every single month. And I can't wait to see what's next. Oh, thanks so much, man. We really appreciate all the support, sincerely. It's, uh, it means a lot. Yeah, and, and, and even beyond the support, we, uh, we really love what you're doing with the channel, and, and thanks Absolutely. for supporting this whole community and bringing people together. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, hope everybody enjoys this, and uh, pick up the next Canadian International release, and we'll see you next time.